watching. Before we get started, I want to remind you that if there is anything that you need prayer for, please don't hesitate to give us a call, send us an email, or submit a request online. We'd love to stand with you in prayer. Today is part two of Thanksgiving and Praise. Last week, we talked about our relationship with God and having a thankful heart. Today, Pastor is talking to us about praising God, how when we bless God, we actually praise Him. Let's take a look. I want to talk again about praise and thanksgiving. Now, I'd kind of like to start the message with Revelation chapter 4 and verse 21. Excuse me, verse 11. It says, For you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. For your pleasure they are and were created. You know, so many people are looking for the purpose of life. It's kind of like the big thing, what's the purpose of life? And, and it's really interesting if you go into the secular world and, and they'll basically tell you, we don't know, but make one up so you got something to live for. Because otherwise you're just going to get really depressed. Right? But the purpose of life, here's, here's our problem. We start with ourselves, And we're like, what's, what, what is, what, what, you, you can't start with yourself and find the purpose of life. Because there was someone who created you, and they created you, get this, for thy pleasure. God, the, the purpose of your life, get this, is to bring pleasure to God. For thy pleasure they are and were created. The reason that you are is to give pleasure to God. Think about that. You know, when we try to start with ourselves, we miss out. You've got to start with God in order to understand the purpose of life. So, in Hebrews 13 and verse 15, it says, Therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Now notice it says to continually be offering the sacrifice of praise. Not on Sunday morning, not when it's convenient, not when you feel like it, but continually on bad days when the giant or the circumstances or the mountain is right in front of you, when things are going badly, when you don't feel like it. What we need to do when we don't feel it, we need to be continually offering the sacrifice of praise. And it's the fruit of our lips. Somebody said, well, I just feel it. It ain't good enough. You know, yeah, somebody said, but first of all, I would tell you, you should probably inform your face. Because your face is not showing it. But the Bible says what God's looking for, he is looking for the fruit of our lips. In uh, Ezra chapter 3, Ezra has come back and they're, they're rebuilding Jerusalem. And they came to rebuild the temple. Cyprus had sent them back to rebuild the temple. And the Bible says that the day comes, they lay the foundation for the temple. And then all the people shouted with a great shout when they had praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. And it says that they heard them a great distance away. This was a great shout. Now, they didn't shout at the dedication ceremony. They shouted when the foundation was laid. Anybody can shout when you already have the victory. Anybody can shout when the giant is laying down dead. Anybody can shout when the walls have fallen down. But when we need to begin to praise, when we need to begin to shout, is when we begin to believe God, when we see the littlest bit of progress moving in the right direction, there needs to be a shout of praise that comes out of our mouth. Now, unfortunately, many of us never shout, ever. You can do some shouting. Yeah, you can begin to praise him. The Bible says in Psalms 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Listen, when you praise God, you bless God. You are blessing God. You are giving God pleasure when you bless the Lord with praise and with thanksgiving. Uh, in, in the de there's, a, there's, a, there's a small book in the Bible, but the, the name of the book is Habakkuk. Uh, the Babylonians have just come. They have 
destroyed the cities of Israel, including Jerusalem. They have defeated the armies of Israel, and they have taken the majority of the people captive. And the prophet writes this. He says, though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vine, nor the labor of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stall. He said, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord's my strength. He makes my feet like deer's feet, and he sets me on my high places. Now, notice he's saying, look, there's all sorts of things that can be going wrong that aren't working out right. He said, but no matter what, I'm going to remember the Lord is my salvation, and I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. Now, I don't know if you've done this, but I recommend you read the end of the Bible. We win. It does not matter how bad things are down here. It doesn't matter how many circumstances are, are on the top of you, how many giants you face, how bad you feel. It doesn't matter because in the end, we win. Let me read a little bit of the end of the book. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, the tabernacle of God's with men, he'll dwell with them. And they will be his people. God himself will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eye. There will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And he said, behold, I make all things new. Do you know, no matter how bad it is, you're going to win. You're saved. You're blood bought. You're a part of the family of God. You're on your way to heaven. The day's coming. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more regret. It's going to be gone. If you can focus on the right thing, no matter what's going on around you, you can rejoice in the Lord. And that's what Habakkuk's saying. He's saying, look, every city, the walls have been knocked down. Our army is defeated. The majority of the people, they only left a few poor people in the land. They've all been taken captive. He said, everything's going bad. The fig tree's not working. The vines aren't doing what they're supposed to. The olive tree's falling. The, the, The flock is cut off. Everything's bad, but I will rejoice in the Lord. We need to get that attitude. It's a decision to be thankful. It's a decision to rejoice. When Jesus healed 10 lepers, how many came back and said, thank you? One, one. Our default mode is to just take everything for granted and look at the negative. That's our default mode. You know, it, it would do every one of us good to go home and write down 30 things that we're thankful for and just lift our hands and begin to say, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Because of what you've done. Now listen, you cannot be thankful and be praising God and still feel discouraged and depressed. It will break that thing right off you. And unfortunately, what people do is they say, well, I just don't feel good about it. You know, things are bad. I'm discouraged. I'm depressed. You can't let your feelings dominate you. Jesus said, do not let your heart be troubled. Now, according to Jesus, please don't get mad at me. But if you're depressed and your heart is troubled, according to Jesus, you're letting it happen. You are letting, he said, don't let that be. Don't let that be in your life. You see, we, we're just like, well, that's what I feel, so that's the way it is. But Jesus said, you can take dominion over your feelings. If you will refocus on the right things, those feelings, they will change. Don't let your heart be troubled. Listen. Uh, when, when Jesus went to his hometown of Nazareth, it's in, it's in Luke 4, they delivered to him the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Bible says he finds the place where it's written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he begins to read. He says, because the Lord has sent me, he's anointed me and he sent me to, he, to, to preach good tidings to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, the opening of prisons to those who are bound, And if you go to Isaiah and read this this passage, this is what it says. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. So this is what God wants to do. He wants to give you the garment of praise or thanksgiving 
for the spirit of heaviness. Now, heaviness is an old English word that means depression. But this is what the Bible says, that if you will put on a garment of praise and you will begin to praise God for who he is and for what he's done, he said, all of that stuff that's on you, it's just going to fall off. You cannot have a garment of praise and thanksgiving and have a spirit of depression and heaviness on top of you. It will break that thing. It will cause that thing to go. David said this in Psalms 69 in verse 30. He said, I will praise the name of my God with singing and I will magnify him with thanksgiving. I will magnify him. Well, I've got a magnifying glass right here. All right. Now, something here is being magnified. I don't know if you can see that. I hope all of you get it. All right. I think I got the right camera right there. Something's getting magnified. Now, you're looking at my eye and you're like, ah, scary thing. All right. Now, first of all, notice you did not make my eye any bigger, but you saw it more clearly. You saw exactly what it was. Right? Now, the Bible says this about God. It says the universe cannot contain him. So you aren't going to make God any bigger. But when you begin to praise him with singing and you begin to magnify him with thanksgiving, when you begin to thank him for what he's done for you, all of a sudden you begin to see who is really there. You begin to see the qualities and the characteristics of God. You begin to see his faithfulness. You begin to see the love that he has for you. You begin to see him as a deliverer. You begin to see him not as someone who's far away, but you begin to see God as somebody who's close, somebody who's moving in your life, somebody who's done great things for you. Right? You magnify him. Now, Psalms 116, scholars are kind of disagree on this. A number of scholars say, you know, David didn't write it. Others say David wrote it. I, I, I go with the guys that David wrote this song. Right? And, and I actually think that David wrote this psalm when he was fleeing from Absalom his son, who is trying to kill him so he can become king. Now, I'm going to tell you what happens to me. When bad things happen, my mind takes off at like a thousand miles an hour. And it paints the worst possible case scenario that can happen. Anybody else, your mind, when something bad happens, it's like, oh, you know. I mean, I got a headache and it's like, ah, oh, you got an aneurysm. Right. Just, just, just little, whatever little thing happens, it's like your mind just like blows the thing way out of proportion. All right. So, so David, his son is trying to kill him. But not only is he going to kill him, he's going to kill the entire family. He's going to kill all of David's close connections in the, in the nation of Israel. That was what would happen when pagan kings came. So David says this. He says, return to your rest, O my soul. Return to your rest. So literally, David's spirit is talking to his mind, right? Now, how many of you know we all talk to each other? Well, we talk to each other. We talk to ourselves, yeah. right? Somebody might think you're crazy if you're talking to yourself. You're only crazy if you're arguing with yourself, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but talking to yourself, that's normal. In fact, you just say, well, I'm just, I'm just obeying the Bible. Because in the Bible, David talks to himself, Come on, man. right? But, but what... What we've got to do is we've got to have our spirit start talking to our mind, telling our mind what to do, what to think. So this is what David does. He's talking to himself, and his spirit is saying, look, you don't need to have all this fear. And then this is what he does. He says, for the Lord has dealt bountifully. He begins to magnify the Lord with thanksgiving. The Lord has dealt bountifully with you. And you look at David. And first of all, God said to him, he said, look, he said, I took you from watching the sheep and I've made you the king of Israel. God has blessed him. But, but beyond that, think of it this way. David has been fleeing from King Saul for 10 years. The Bible says that Saul became his enemy continually and sought to kill him every day. 
the king with unlimited resources trying to kill you. It is his number one priority is killing you. And he says, God, <laughs> he said, you delivered my soul from death. All those years that Saul was trying to kill me, you delivered me. You never let him touch me, not so much as a hair of my head. He said, God, you are awesome. And then he says, in my eyes from tears. You know, we often just look at a Bible character and think, well, they never had any problems. But let me just tell you a little bit about David's problems. He had a son that was born into his family. He died when he wasn't even a month old. He had a son who raped his, his daughter. He had a son that killed another one of his sons. David literally had a broken heart again and again and again. He said, but God, you delivered my eyes from tears. How many of you know God is the healer of our broken hearts? And he looked at that and he said, God, thank you. That of all the stuff I've been through, you delivered my eyes from, from tears. You healed my heart. And then he said, my feet from falling. And we all know this story. David commits adultery with Bathsheba. And then in order to not get caught, she sends her husband, he sends her husband into a battle and tells the leading general, retreat so that he's killed. And he gets killed. Adultery and murder. My feet from falling. But the prophet Nathan came and talked to David and he repented. And then David later said this. He said, he said you have set me in a large place and you have put my feet on a solid rock. He had failed. He had fallen completely. Adultery, murder. It's interesting. Those are the only two sins in the Old Testament there was no sacrifice for. Adultery and murder. David committed them both. But yet, when he went to God and he repented, he received forgiveness. God picked him up, put him on a solid rock, put him in a large place. And David looks back at those things. And you know what it does? It caused faith to rise up in his heart. David said, I will magnify the Lord with thanksgiving. And when we begin to be thankful for what God has done, we don't make God bigger, but we begin to see him as the covenant-keeping, promise-keeping God that he is, the God who said, I'll never leave you, I will never physically leave you, and I will never turn my heart away from you. You're the apple of my eye. We begin to see God for who he is when we begin to be thankful. Now, we can focus on the right things or we can focus on the wrong things. The Apostle Paul wrote, and he said this, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on, meditate on these things. See, we need to think about the right things. When Habakkuk was one of the prophets in Israel, the Babylonian king came conquered the land, destroyed all the cities, and took the people captive. And the Bible tells the story of when they arrived. Now, Jeremiah was a friend of Habakkuk. They were both prophets at that time. And this is what Jeremiah told them. As they arrived in Babylon, he said, build houses and dwell in them, plant gardens, eat the fruit, take wives and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons and your daughters, and husbands, so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may increase there and not diminish. Seek the peace of the city where I cause you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace, you'll find peace. And Jeremiah said, God is going to visit you. He's going to bring you back to your land. And they get there, and this is what they do. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. Now, Instead of looking at the promises that God had given them, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to prosper you, I'm going to bring you back to your own land. Instead of that, they look back at the problems, at the things that had happened. How many of you realize that hindsight is always 20-20? You can always look back and say, I should have, I could have, it would have been better if I had. 
right? And that's exactly what they're doing. They look back and they said, man, if we had just repented and listened to Jeremiah, if we hadn't done this and if we had done that, then everything would be different and we wouldn't have lost our homes and we wouldn't have been defeated and the Babylonians wouldn't have come. We wouldn't have been here if we had just done this and if we had just done that. How many of you know anybody can get depressed looking at what could have been, should have been, and might have been? All right? You can look at when you should have put it in the stock market and when you should have taken it out. Right? You, you can just look at what you should have said and not should have said. You, you can always find that stuff. But they're looking at the past, at what went wrong, instead of at the promises of God. They're not looking at whatsoever things are true and noble and just and pure and lovely and of a good report. They're looking back at what could have been, should have been, and might have been. Right? So what do they do? It says we weep. We get depressed. It says we hang our harps in the willows. Now, in those days, the harp was the main instrument for worshiping God. Now, listen, when you get depressed, you don't want to praise the Lord. You don't. You come to church, you sit there. Somebody else is like this, you go, hypocrite. You get mad at them. Look at them worship. Don't they know how bad it is? Life sucks. What are they doing? You know why? It's because you're focusing on the wrong things. You start focusing on the fact that God loves you, that he'll never leave you, that he'll never turn his heart away from you, that he redeemed you, that he is planning on taking you to heaven, that he's preparing a mansion for you, that you've been justified, you've been made the righteousness of God in Christ, you're washed in the blood, he's got a plan and a purpose for you now. Man, you focus on the right things, begin to be thankful for the right things, and all of that stuff, it falls off. All right? There they carried us away captive. They asked of us a song. Those who plundered of us requests of us mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land or when we're depressed, when we're down, but when we focus on the right things and we magnify the Lord, everything changes. Everything changes. David is not king yet, and he's uh, living in the land of the Philistines. And he and his men are gone, and while they're gone, the Amalekites come, they hit the city where they live, the city of Ziglag. The Bible says they burned it to the ground. They took every person and all of the goods, and they left. And when David and his men got back, the Bible says that they sat down and they wept until they had no more strength. They were so discouraged. And it says that David was greatly distressed. For the people spoke of stoning him. Now, how many of you know when you're discouraged, it is a bad time to make a decision? You almost always make the wrong decision when you're discouraged. They're discouraged, and so they're like, let's kill David. Like, what's that going to help? That's not going to help anything. Because the soul of the people were grieved, every man for his son and his daughter. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. David strengthened himself in the Lord. I praise God. I, I pray that every person here, that you've got four faith crazy friends, right? That when you get down, they're there to pray for you. They're there to text you, to give you a word and tell you, look, God's going to see you through. We're here with you. We're believing with you. But you know what? There can come a day when there's nobody like that around you. Amen. That's what David had. But the Bible says he encouraged himself. He encouraged himself in the Lord. He began to look at what God had already done for him, right? And, of course, as he does that, God gives him a word, says, go, pursue, you will recover all. And David and the men they go after, they get all their families back. They get all of their stuff back. When Jehoshaphat is king of Israel, they bring word to Jehoshaphat, and they say the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, three nations, they've joined together. And they're springing a surprise sneak attack on you. And they are 24 hours away. And it's the first time the king hears about it. The Bible says he gathers the people and they pray. And they feel God gives them a word that God's going to deliver them. So they get up the next morning. And God had said, this is where you to go. And they get the army together. And then he consults with the people. I, I love this. They arose early in the morning, went to the wilderness of Tekoa. Jehoshaphat stood and said, hear me, O Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe the Lord your God and you will be established. 
That's a word for every one of us every day. Believe the Lord your God and you will be established. Believe his prophets, you'll prosper. When he consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord, who should praise the beauty of holiness. And they went out before the army saying, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Now the Navy SEALs do not have this strategy. Right? So what he did is he got their top guys in front and then he put the choir in front of the army. And the choir goes out to attack the enemy with songs. Literally. Right? And the Bible says that when they begin to praise God, that God showed up. If they begin to sing, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Moab, Ammon, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah and they were defeated. God literally put confusion on the enemy. The three armies attack each other and killed each other down to the last man. And when they got there, all that they had to do was walk into the victory that God had given them. I believe it's a picture of what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be praising. We're supposed to be worshiping. We're supposed to be giving thanksgiving. And as we do, God moves ahead of us. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In everything give thanks. Be thankful in everything. Now, not for everything, but in everything. I remember when I, I first became a Christian 40-some years ago, there was a, a very popular book out at the time. And this book actually used several illustrations. And one of the illustrations was that if you were getting a divorce, you were supposed to thank God for the divorce. Well, let me just tell you, God is not the author of divorce. Amen. And you shouldn't thank God for that divorce. But you should thank God in the midst of that divorce, that he loves you, that you're a child of God, that you're on your way to heaven, that you're blood washed, that you're justified, that God has a plan and a purpose for you. You can thank him in the middle of not whatever is going on. Another example that this book used was a person who receives a, a diagnosis, a terminal diagnosis from the doctor. They said, you've got cancer and you're going to die and you've got a short period of time to live. And the book said, thank God for the cancer. Listen, God doesn't have any cancer. He didn't bring it. He didn't give it. Right? Jesus said the thief, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Yeah. He said, but I've come that you may have life, that you might have it abundantly. James said every good gift, every perfect gift comes down from the Father of light in whom there is no variation nor shadow of turning. It's the good, it's the perfect that comes down from God. Right? So what, what we're saying is this. No matter what's going on, we can thank God in the middle of it. Not because God gave it, but because God is with us no matter what is going on. Psalms 46, verse 1. The Lord is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, I will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried away into the midst of the sea. What David is saying, he said, it doesn't matter how bad my world gets turned upside down, the Lord is my refuge and my strength, a very present time, present help in time of trouble. The Lord is my light and salvation. Of whom shall I fear? The Lord is on your side. Psalms 118. The Lord is on my side. I'll not fear. What can man do to me? Isaiah 46, 10. Yeah, it says, I declare the end from the beginning and from ancient times, that which is not yet saying, my counsel will stand. I'll do all my pleasure. God said, I'm going to work in you no matter what is going on. Jesus said to his disciples, it's I. Don't be afraid. I tell you, Jesus is with you no matter what happens. Again, Hebrews 13, he will never physically leave you nor turn his heart away from you. No matter what's going on around you, the Lord is your refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried away into the midst of the sea. Whatever's going on, he's on your side. He's with you. 
And we need to begin to look at the promises of God, praise Him for His promises, thank Him for what He's done in our life, and begin to see God move on our behalf. Say, if you've been watching today, but in your heart, you know you're not right with God. You're away from the Lord. You need to get right. I want to invite you to pray a prayer with me to give your life to Jesus, to receive forgiveness, to get right. And also, if you're watching, but you don't know where you stand with God. As so many people, they figure, when I die, I'll find out if I made it to heaven. But the Bible says in 1 John, we've written these things that you may know that you have everlasting life. You're supposed to know today that you're forgiven, that you're right with God, that you're on your way to heaven. Not when I die, I'll find out if I made it. And if you need to know today that you're right with God, I want to invite you also, bow your head, pray this prayer with us. Say, oh God, I believe Jesus died on the cross. I believe his blood paid for my sins. And I believe that he rose again. Today, I give him all of my heart, in all of my life. I turn my back on my old life. I'm not going to live for myself any longer. I'm going to live for Jesus every day. I thank you. You've heard my prayer that I'm forgiven, that my past is gone, that I'm a part of your kingdom today and forever in Jesus name. Amen. You know, if you prayed that prayer from your heart, God heard your prayer. You're right with God. You're on your way to heaven. And we want you to keep growing spiritually. In fact, I wrote a book full of bullet points to help you growing spiritually. We want to give it to you absolutely free of charge. Now, you can download it electronically, or if you'll contact us, we will send you a hard copy free of charge. And again, full of bullet points to help you keep growing in God. Keep your relationship with Jesus alive. Thank you so much for being with us. God bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with Pastor Dwayne, you are making one of the best decisions of your life. We are so happy for you. To receive a copy of Pastor's free book, you can go to walkingbyfaith.tv and request a copy of the book to be mailed to you. Or you can download it right there instantly. Either way, it's absolutely free. While online, you can purchase a copy of today's message, Praise, in the WBF store. You can also download Pastor's notes that go with this message under the On Demand page. Walking by Faith is used across the globe to spread the truth that changes lives on and off the air. To partner with us financially in this great commission, go to walkingbyfaith.tv slash give. If God is using Walking by Faith to change your life, we'd love to hear about it. You can connect with us on Facebook or send an email to your story at walkingbyfaith.tv. Until next time, be blessed.